Welcome back to California Forest News. In our last episode, we checked in with the superintendent of the El Dorado Hotshots, Ben Strawn, to learn a little bit more about what a hotshot crew is and how they function in wildfire response. In this episode, we're gonna continue the conversation with Ben to learn a little bit more about how longer, more intense fire seasons are impacting our firefighters out on the line, protecting communities and natural resources. So Ben, your crew is in a adrenaline rich environment. You are in a dynamic environment with flame and equipment operating. You're having to come up with a plan, using all this brain power, and then you guys are hiking out or, or hiking across this landscape. Sounds like you're burning through a lot of calories. And I ask because you've tracked some of this. Some of the research coming out of Missoula um, and some of the stuff I've tracked for myself, it's not uncommon to have burned roughly 4,000 to 6,000 calories in a, in a fire shift. And so uh, how do we compare that? I, I believe uh, Olympic swimmers in training are burning like 6,000 calories. We also talked about hiking, right? I mean, that's part of it. When I, when I picture hot shots, I picture hot shots with tool in hand, hiking up, going where other folks might not go. Do you have any metric of tracking how far you've hiked? How many, how much you hike in an average day? Have you done any research there? Sure, so like we can use miles, right? But uh, you know, what I think most people understand is like total of steps in a day. Like I think it's, it's very uh, common knowledge that 10,000 steps is roughly what the general population is trying to accomplish per day. Uh, easily do 30,000 uh, steps in a day, like no problem. So 30,000 steps and not on a sidewalk, we're going up, yes. stepping over logs, Elevation, walking around fire. Heat. Um, you, are you carrying equipment with you at all? <laughs> yeah. You know, 50 pounds is not uncommon. You know, like oh. maybe there's people that are carrying like, you know, 30 to 35, but our Sawyers, not only are they carrying roughly 40 to 45 on their back, but they're also hump, humping around a chainsaw on their shoulder. Uh, yeah, it's steep. You know, you're wearing long sleeves and pants and a hard hat. It's, you know, we're, we're fighting fire in the summer and we're a national resource. So this year we were in Arizona on the Telegraph fire uh, and we were seeing temperatures of 118 degrees with 2% RH um, and still trying to put down those kinds of miles and, wow. and stuff. So, yeah. Wow. Ben, you've been hotshot for 16 years. I think a firefighter, a wildland firefighter now for 21 years. Um, in light of the last two fire seasons, what have you noticed is changing with fire season? Well, I think the change has been happening even before that. Um, definitely much more noticeable in the last two years. Uh, you know, what we're seeing is what everybody else is seeing in the public. The fires are getting much larger. They're, uh, they're much more intense and they're becoming very hard to manage. Um, I think at this point, it's safe to say that climate change has something to do with it. Walk us through what a modern fire season is like for your crew um, with its length and intensity. The impacts have been pretty significant and it's, it's undeniable. Uh, the, the biggest issue that I, that I see, the biggest impacts that I see is, you know, we base all our shifts off of 16 hour shifts. So we work 16 hours and then we have eight hours off. It's very hard to adhere to those time frames nowadays because of the the growth in the fire perimeter, how it changes, and the lack of resources that we've been having the, these last few years. So, the physical aspects of the job are still present, but we're doing them for longer durations of time now, and and uh, and less recovery in between those long durations of time. It's not uncommon for us to work 24 hours, 32 hours, 48 hours straight, get five hours of sleep and do it again. Wake up. Acquiring that level of stress, the, what that does to your, your, the physiology within your body, your decision-making is gonna go down. Risk of injury is gonna go up. Like, it's, there's all these very negative consequences and the recovery time it takes to get to a, a place where you're good again is, it takes a long time. It's, it, we're constantly being faced with a moral and ethical decision. 
do we leave and get the guys rest um, and potentially watch this community burn to the ground? Or do we stay in the fight and try and do everything we can to protect life and property at the risk of my people? That's a, that's a really heavy challenge. And that's what we're being, uh, that's what we're encountering more and more and more. What do you think that does to, to mental health? I think people are aware of what this is doing to our folks. Um, uh, and I think hopefully there's conversations happening that are going to help mitigate some of this. Um, but the mental health thing is significant. I mean, it's not unknown that there's, uh, we have a 30% higher rate of suicide within our population uh, as compared to the general population. So uh, that's a significant number. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the amount of stress that we acquire and our, and our lack of ability to recover from it. But awareness is a big part of it. And I think this, these conversations are important to have because that builds that awareness. What comes after awareness? What's, what's next? After awareness uh, happens and we can all agree on, on what we're dealing with, it's about coming together collectively uh, from the top down and, and working with the, the, the public to come up with actionable solutions. And I think we can get there. I think this, this agency has demonstrated um, its ability to create significant positive change. Um, and we don't have to look that far back. We can talk about 1910, the big burn, when all this stuff was created. And uh, when the Forest Service became the tip of the spear in developing things like hotshot crews and smoke jumpers and rappel ships and, and all these specialty resources and became the premier place for how to fight wildland fire in the world. And I think we can get back there, but I think it's gonna take all of us uh, working together to come up with these solutions.